people can come in if they, if anyone is joining late. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone to another installment of the GOCC. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Joe Cummings from the University of Kentucky, <clears throat> and he will be talking about phylogenetic networks. And uh, before he begins, I just remind everyone of our community statements. We have uh, three guiding principles. Uh, one is that we're all learning. Uh, one is that we uh, that not everyone has all the answers. And there's a third one as well that I thought I knew off the top of my head at this point, but I couldn't remember. So if anyone wants well, to Well, no one has in, all the answers. Uh, no one has all the answers, yeah. I think is that, yeah. All right, but anyway, with that all uh, said, uh, let's welcome Joe. So Joe, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, so yeah, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, phylogenetic networks. And um, this project was joined with my advisor, Chris Mannon and uh, Ben Hollering, who's currently a grad student at NC State. And um, yeah, so let's go ahead and dive in. If you have any questions, just feel free to to interrupt and ask. Oh, I could, see. oh, there we go, okay. So uh, yeah, an overview, we're gonna do some phylogenetics background, then we're gonna say, hey, that problem's too hard. So we're gonna restrict to what's called the CFN model. And up to this point, we'll be talking about trees. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll talk about networks where uh, things get a little bit more complicated than the tree case. And that's where uh, all the work that Ben, Chris, and I did. So yeah, what is phylogenetics? So sort of the main problem that we have is maybe we have a collection of species and what we'd like to do is we'd like to find the evolutionary tree that you know best fits uh, their history. So maybe you have three species, human, chimp, and gorilla, and you'd like to know, well, uh, which one of these trees is more accurate for their evolution? So that's sort of the setup and the question that we'd like to ask. So the way that we do this is we have, you know, kind of going back, like if you're Charles Darwin, okay, I have a, I forgot, I have a Charles Darwin anecdote here. If you're Charles Darwin, then what you might do is you might measure like femur bones or something and then sort of make sort of a scientific educated guess. And that's all great and all, but you know, at some point you're sort of, there's going to be some uncertainty there. And so now that we have, uh, we're in the wonderful world of uh, DNA sequencing, um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to use, uh, you know, collected data from DNA sequences from different species in order to make these judgments of which tree to use. So we're gonna have DNA bases. They are A, G, C, and T. And I think they are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, but I could be wrong. And if you're a biologist and I'm wrong, let me know. Um, we're going to assume that, you know, related species always have a single common ancestor. And we're going to assume that we have sort of an alignment of DNA sequences. So sort of in this picture here, the columns are lining up. So this is like the same sort of gene that's appearing in the, in like all DNA sequences and they're, they're sort of related. So it's like, this is a switch that appears in all DNA sequences and it's either a, G, C, or T in each one. And um, finding, you know, actually like constructing a DNA al uh, sequence alignment is sort of difficult. That's a problem on its own, but for us, we're just gonna assume we have. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume that the columns evolve independently and we are going to fix a single column. We're just gonna look at that. And uh, from all the data that we collect, we're going to compute, uh, you know, a joint probability distribution uh, that basically says, you know, like we're collecting all the data that says if I chose a random chimp, human, and gorilla, what's the probability? Tuple that uh, records what all these. Your internet cut off there for a second. Do you mind repeating that last uh, sentence? Oh yeah, so about the joint probability distribution? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're sort of just saying that like, if you, if you picked a random chimp, a human and gorilla, 
what's the probability that, uh, you know, in this specific column of the DNA sequence that, you know, human is C, chimp is T, and gorilla is A. So we've computed this, this are, these are sort of observable things that we can collect data on. And our goal is to develop a, a tree detector. So we'd like a tool that tells us that, okay, we've computed this joint probability distribution and uh, this tree is gonna be some sort of model that would allow that probability distribution to happen. Um, and so our goal is to sort of develop this tool. So here is an example. So we're gonna have, we're gonna have a hidden Markov model uh, which basically just says that, for example, X3, um, it only, you know, there's, it, it's not like totally independent of all the other variables, but it only depends on Y2. And Y2, it, you know, it will only depend on Y1 and so on and so forth. But for example, X3, you know, if it's A, you know, it doesn't matter what Y1 is, it somehow doesn't see it, it's too far away. Um, we're gonna have our observable variables, which are gonna be at the leaves. So these are our current species and they're gonna take on values A, C, G, and T. We have our hidden variables, A, C, G, and T. We're also gonna fix a root distribution. So in this case, our root is Y1. And this is just saying, you know, uh, what's the probability that Y1 is A, C, G, or T. And then we have transition matrices for each edge in the tree. And all these are doing is they're recording the different conditional probabilities. So for example, if we look at M0, which is the edge that goes from Y1 to Y2, uh, and we look at maybe the Gth column and the Cth row, we see that the entry there is uh, the probability that Y2 is G given that Y1 is C. Sort of, we have this big thing that's just sort of, you can think of it as just sort of like a bookkeeping device. Um, it's just recording all the conditional probabilities and that together with the root distribution should be enough to be able to uh, compute uh, a joint probability distribution on the loops. And in fact, it is, you can compute it relatively easily. Um, it's this sum over all possible internal states of the hidden variables. And then you have the appropriate um, matrix entries being multiplied along with the appropriate element of the root distribution being multiplied. And you sum over all internal states and that will give you the uh, probability that you observe little x1, little x2, and little x3 along the loops. And whatever this equation is, it, I mean, it matters, but first of all, it's kind of complicated. It's not a lot of terms because we're summing over all possible internal states. But the thing that we wanna keep in mind here is that um, what we see is that the probability distribution is a polynomial in terms of the matrix entries of the transition matrices and the entries in the root distribution. And so that's gonna allow us to, do so, to use some tools from algebraic geometry to try to solve this problem. Um, and then just briefly, I wanna say what it, what it looks like in general. It's basically the same picture. We have a bunch of leaves, which are observable random variables. Maybe they don't take on A, C, G, and T, but maybe they take on the values one through kappa or kappa is anything you like. And we have transition matrices and a root distribution. And when you do this, you can compute the joint probability distribution and again, um, it's a polynomial in the entries of pi and the transition matrices. So there's a lot on this slide, but really what you should take away is just that, you know, there's, there's some polynomial that you can write down um, in terms of entries in, the, in, the, in pi and uh, the MEs, and uh, that will give you our um, P X1 through X. Any questions so far? Okay. So yeah, now we're going to uh, introduce some terms from algebraic geometry, which you may already know, but I'm gonna say them anyway. Um, so a variety X. Um, the... Could you go back? Yes. Okay. Uh, could you back, go back another? Here? So, 
so these x1 x2 x3 um mm-hmm. so they should be independent right like so it doesn't matter how we arrange them um, um i don't think they're totally independent right because like x1 depends on well i guess what do you mean by independent like um i guess what i'm saying is is that like you know so if um you know the probability of observing like a a a here you know okay. you can write that purely in terms of these um these matrices so you'd be picking out like this in here this x1 would be a x2 would be a and x3 would be a and then you'd be summing over all possible internal states should be like you know four to the something like i would imagine like a t and a t a would have some okay maybe not I guess so really the only restrictions that we're making on the on the variables here is that you know that follows like this markov model. And so we're saying that x1 really only depends on what y1 is. And x3 x3 and x2 only depend on y2 and y2 depends on y1. So we're not really making many assumptions here which is sort of a as we'll see it's sort of a problem. Um, I guess does that answer your question at all? I uh, it, it's fine I think it will become clear. Okay. If it doesn't, let me know. Okay. So uh, we need some tools from algebraic geometry. So uh, first of all, we have a variety. Um, and a variety, we're going to take it over the complex numbers. Um, but it's just uh, the, it's a solution set to a system of polynomials and let's say m variables. So it'll be some, you know, subset of c to the m because our variables are taking on values x1 through xn. We also have a vanishing ideal, um, which if you start with a variety or really any set, and you look at all the polynomials that um, vanish on the entire set X, um, those uh, that forms an ideal in the polynomial ring and in variables. And um, what we wanna do now is uh, we have this polynomial parameterization of our probability distribution from the previous slide. And uh, this theta t, so theta t you should think about as being all the possible fillings of our transition matrices and root distributions. So this is just, uh, these are root distributions and transition matrices space. And then the delta k to the n minus one, um, this is where our joint probability distributions are living. So the image of this map what it will be is it will be all possible, um, all possible uh, distributions that you could get from um, fillings of the matrices and root distribution. And so what we'd like to know is the way that we're gonna check to see if our observed probability distribution comes, could come from a tree T what we'll do is we'll look at this parameterization and we'll ask, hey, does it lie in the image of this map? Um, and so there's a way to do that. And what you do is we're gonna, our tree detector is just gonna be the vanishing ideal of the image of this, uh, polynomial, of this polynomial parameterization. And uh, this will be an ideal in uh, C, P, X1 through Xn where our Xi's are living in K. So it will be a subset of uh, C to the, kappa to the n. And um, elements of this ideal are called uh, phylogenetic invariants. So sort of like, here's like a naive way that you could see if the tree that you have is correct. What you could do is you could compute this ideal, let's say in Macaulay 2, and you could ask what a, a Grobner basis is uh, with respect to some term ordering. And you could take your observed probability distribution plug it into these polynomials. And if they all zero out on this generating set, that means you lie on the image of this polynomial parameterization. And that's supposed to mean that this tree is a good fit. There is a possible filling of the transition matrices and root distributions so that everything works out. Um, and that's great. But um, 
it doesn't really work because for example, even on the example on the previous, on the two slides ago, where we had just three leaves, if you ask Macaulay two to do that in sort of this full generality, we've made no restrictions on anything, um, it, it like won't do it like at all. Like I can't get my computer to compute the smallest non-trivial case, which is lame. So um, we need to make some more assumptions on our model. And so the model that we're gonna be dealing with is uh, the cavender ferris Neyman model, which is known as the CFN model for the beginnings of their names. And the first assumption we're gonna make is we're not gonna have four, our, our random variables are not gonna be taking on values A, G, C, and T. We're gonna group them together. So A and G are gonna to correspond to zero and C and T are gonna to correspond to one. We're thinking of these as living in Z mod two. And the reason they're grouped together this way is like some like protein structure reason. So like A and G have like similar protein structures than C and T do or something like that. So there's some like natural way that these group together biologically, chemically. We're also gonna assume that the root distribution is uniform. And we're gonna assume our transition matrices are symmetric. So the way that you should think about the entries in these transition matrices is, you know, the probability that you know, uh, you're, that the, the child is zero given that the uh, parent is zero is the same as, you know, the probability that the child is one given that the parent is one. So it's sort of like alpha, you can think of as the probability that you stay the same and beta is the probability that you switch from zero to one or one to zero. Uh, we also have these functions. Uh, which will become, their reasons will become clear shortly. Um, we have this function uh, from Z mod two to R and we're just saying like, hey, send zero to alpha and send one to beta. And the reason we do this is because if you look at the GH entry of ME, uh, you can realize that it's just FE of uh, G minus H. And so now what we're gonna do is with all these assumptions, so with pi being uniform and these functions FE, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite the polynomial parameterization and it's gonna look nice. Oh, I should also say that um, when you do the CFN model and you assume that pi is uniform, you actually lose where the root is. So you no longer know where the root is. So that's like one drawback of some of the assumptions that we've made is you know, we have the leaves, but uh, the root could be really placed anywhere in this tree on the right and it would give you the same. But okay, that's fine. You know, it was impossible before, at least it'll be doable now. So yeah, the, the joint probability distribution, so the probability of observing G1 through GN. So we got this one half for the, um, for the root distribution, which is now uniform, uh, that's always one half and you sum over all internal states. Um, and then now instead of matrix entries, we're writing it as uh, in terms of these functions, uh, F U V. Um, and if you kind of stare at this and you know a lot about Fourier transforms, you're gonna say like, hey, that looks like a convolution, uh, some sort of convolution over Z mod two to the N. And um, in fact it is, so there's the punchline, hooray. We can just we can uh, we can make a linear change of coordinates using a discrete Fourier transform for z mod two to the n, and uh, what it ends up doing is we're going to have new coordinates which we're going to call q's instead of p's, and our image coordinates instead of alpha and betas we're going they're going to be indexed by edges in the tree and group elements in z mod two. And the beautiful thing is that when you do this discrete Fourier transform that sum over all internal states actually just turns into a nice monomial. Like, hooray, we did it, great. And the reason monomial maps are nice is because uh, the, the uh, tree ideal, IT, in this new change of coordinates is gonna be prime and it's gonna be generated by binomials. So it'll be a toric ideal. And uh, toric ideals are great, toric varieties are great. Um, they're things that we can actually work with. Um, the other thing that it does is, uh, and this was a uh, this was noticed by uh, Sternfels and Sullivan in a the paper in a paper they wrote in two thousand six, 
is that the parameterization actually factors when you split uh, a tree along an edge. So not only, and we'll see that on the next slide, but um, what it's gonna allow us to do is it says like, hey, you don't even have to look at the parameterization for a big tree like this on the left. You can actually just look at the parameterization for the two smaller trees on the right, which means that you can sort of break the problem into like very small pieces, solve those very small pieces and then learn how to glue and then you're done. And so that's more or less what Sternfels and Sullivan did is they said like, hey, if you look at a three leaf tree, I think it's a, like a little claw tree or something. If you can figure out what those are and we're gonna tell you how to glue, then um, you figured out the problem for all trees. You found all the ideas. Uh, I'm curious, can we just break along every edge? Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. Although the only ones that are interesting are ones where, uh, like if you break a leaf off, it's not very interesting. Okay. Because you're splitting the edge in half. So like, so you still get a vertex where you had a leaf, so you... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's look at this ideal IT for the CFM model. It's very nice. So uh, we, have a, we have splits for... So if you pick an edge E, you have a split. If you remove that edge uh, from the tree, you get two connected components. And your split is just the vertices that lie... The leaves that lie... In in each connected component. So in this case, there's only one non-trivial split um, and um, we have the split one, two, uh, and then three, four on the other side. And then here's, we can write down our parameterization actually in terms of splits. So we're gonna send Q, G1 through GN. It's gonna be a product over all non-trivial splits in the graph, in the tree. Um, and then uh, it's A upper E, and then the subscript, and the subscript, remember, was an element of the group C mod two. It's just you sum all the GIs that live on one side of the split. But the only way that this really makes sense is if the two sides of the split have the same sum, which is true if the sum of the GIs is zero because you're in C mod two. So they either both sum up to one or both sum up to zero. So you just choose one and do it. And it turns out that, uh, and then if you, if the sum of the GIs is not zero, then you just send the Q, G1 through GN to zero. And now you can kind of see how this parameterization would factor along a split. So if you split the tree along an edge and you have two different trees, uh, you can sort of see that the parameterization is really just like the product of the two smaller trees. And then uh, our tree detector IT is, you know, a, a kernel of this map. Uh, where the ring homomorphism is given above. Um, and when I write QG1 through GN, I'm, I'm assuming that the sum of the GIs is zero. Otherwise, it's not a prime ideal because, or wait. Yeah, it's not a, well, it's, it's sort of like, you have like sort of silly things going on. Like Q1 and then all zeros get sent to zero. So that's in the ideal, but we sort of just ignore this. Um, okay, so how do you find the ideal? There's actually a really nice picture that you can do. So if you pick a non-trivial split, AE and BE, we're gonna make two matrices. And then our ideal is gonna be generated by all the two by two minors of those two matrices where you do this for every single split. So you, you go over every single split, you make two matrices, you complete, compute the two by two minors, and that ends up giving you uh, a generating set um, for the idea. And this was proved by Sternfels and Sullivan in that 06 paper. And it's actually really nice. It's, it's not so bad to prove. Um, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a cool result. So let's look at our small example. Here's our split, which is one, two, three, four. And we're gonna have our two matrices. We make them as follows. So we're gonna have, uh, on the left here, we have an even matrix. And so the way we should think about this is the rows are indexing um, G1 and G2 in the left-hand side of the split and the columns are indexing G3 and G4. And um, you know, 
what each index corresponds to is you know, all possible ways that the sum of the GIs on that side of the split is even, so it's zero, in Z mod two. And then we, and then same for the columns, except for G3 and G4. And we just sort of put them together, sort of, you know, you can see how they fit together um, in this example. So in the zero, 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 zero column, you get Q, zero, 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 zero. And we also make an odd matrix, same idea, but now it's odd, the sum is odd on both sides. And uh, when you compute the two by two minors, which is just taking two determinants, uh, we get um, two generators and that's the idea. So now it's something that we can actually do. And, um, you know, before, like on a smaller example with only three leaves, we couldn't do it. And now you can do it in like two seconds. Um, and I should also mention that this rank, this two by two minors condition is really like a rank condition. So if you're interested in actually checking this thing quickly, you wouldn't actually compute all the two by two minors and then, um, and then like plug in and then like plug in your probability distributions. What you would do is you would just make the matrices and do like a singular value decomposition and then check that the rank is one. So that actually that the, the fact that it's generated by two by two minors here, that's like a rank condition um, actually makes uh, some of these me methods competitive with other statistical methods, which is kind of neat because a lot of times in algebraic statistics, you have this like cool variety thing but then if you wanna like do it in practice, it's impossible. But like here it's not, it's totally doable. And like real, you know, phylogeneticists have used it before. It's been like implemented in like R, I think. Okay, so that's sort of the story for trees. That was like the Sturmfeld's Sullivan story. It's very nice, it's very pretty. Um, and so now we're gonna move on to networks. So um, are there any questions about the tree case? Yeah, um, I'm still unsure about how the tree detector works. Like, yeah. do I put in a tree? So you, uh, and then it tells me whether or not it is a tree or not. Or I so, mean, it tells me whether it's a suitable tree. Yeah. So you have a you have a probability distribution that you gathered. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh yeah, right. And then you say, okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna Pick a tree, my favorite tree with, mm -hmm. uh, let's say you have n species, a tree with n leaves. Mm -hmm. I'm going to compute this ideal for that tree. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to plug in my probability distribution into these polynomials. And if they all zero out, then that means I've made a good decision. Mm -hmm. That tree was a good choice. Okay. But there's and, not like a easy way to compute all the trees that satisfy. You like have to pick out guesses. Yeah. So one thing that I didn't want to talk about was but I, I'll mention it now is there is sort of like, if you, there is like sort of an, a nice algorithm for tree reconstruction, but mm. you, you have to think a little bit harder about how that algorithm works, but it's basically based on like, you know, you make, you pick like a possible split in the tree and then you see like, oh, are these matrices rank one? And if they are, you're like, oh, that splits in the tree. And then once you sort of recover all those splits, then you've got the tree. Like you can recover the tree from oh, this okay. space. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Beyond trees. So not everything in life uh, is tree-like. Um, so for example, there is this thing called horizontal gene transfer, which is the transfer of genetic material via some other method than parent to offspring. So maybe like two amoebas get too close to each other. One of them breaks the cell wall and like shoots some of its DNA in the other. And now you've got like a new amoeba thingy. Um, so it's actually really common in bacteria and viruses. And you know, this is part of the reason why it's hard, why we have like antibiotic resistant bacteria, just because it's really easy for these things to evolve quickly via methods like horizontal gene transfer. Um, and these are two papers that I thought were funny. So um, in 2015, this slew of authors said that like, um, you know, actually, if you look at, you know, vertebrates, you know, like humans and stuff, uh, horizontal gene transfer is a hallmark of our evolution. Um, and then in 2017, some other dude was like, actually, it's, it's really not. Um, so who knows? 
Um, but uh, it's definitely, it, it definitely happens at least on small scales. Maybe it happens on big scales, but it seems less likely. So now instead of trees, we'll have little networks. So you can see we have little cycles and we'll have to learn how to deal with those. And if you ever wondered how you get a platypus playing the guitar, well, what you do is you just take a uh, platypus playing the flying V and a duck playing the you know, electric piano. There's some horizontal gene transfer going on and boom, platypus playing the guitar. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, let's dive in, let's do it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna deal with level one networks. So uh, in our pictures, the solid edges are gonna be known as tree edges. Dotted edges will be called reticulation edges and reticulation vertices are where reticulation edges meet. So this is where things like horizontal gene transfer are happening. Um, and then the level one part is we're just gonna assume that each biconnected component of our network has one reticulation vertex. So the way you should think about this is it's, it's really just like a bunch of cycles just connected along a tree. So your cycles don't overlap and uh, they don't share any edges and they don't like cross each other or do any weird things like that. Um, and we'll also always assume that um, for any reticulation vertex, there's only two reticulation edges going into it. Okay. And so now what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna say like, hey, well, let's do the CFN model um, on these networks. Um, we're just gonna try to like induce the tree model on this network model. So let's see how to do that. So we're gonna fix a level one network N. Let's say we have M reticulation vertices and we got two M reticulation edges. And there ends up being two to the M underlying trees just by at each reticulation vertex, you choose one of the, um, one of the reticulation edges. And then uh, once you do that, you have a tree, there's two to the M of them. And we're just recording that with the zero one vector sigma here. Um, and then you can say like, okay, well, the CFN network model uh, can be induced by the CFN model for trees. So it's like this uh, sum, you're sort of like mixing together all these, uh, all these CFN models on the underlying trees. And then there's some weight associated to each one. And then you're summing over all two to the M of these size. So the great thing about the tree case was that this psi of T sigma those are monomials. And then it was a toric variety and that was great. And our lives were happy. But now, now it's bad again because now we've got two to the M different terms and it's, it's probably not toric. So we're gonna have to come up with something new. So, uh, and we still have a network detector. The network detector is still the vanishing ideal of the image of this parameterization. Um, and so we're interested in that ideal. Um, but we really need to figure out a way to reduce the number of reticulation vertices so that our life is happy again. So uh, it turns out there's a nice reduction you can do. So uh, uh, myself, uh, Ben and Chris uh, proved that um, if you have two networks that are glued along an edge, then um, you can recover the ideal for the big network by understanding the ideals for the two smaller networks. So, um, and this is like basically repeating the proof um, for the, in the tree case where you could glue along an edge and then you could understand the two smaller trees to get the bigger tree. Um, it's basically the same proof, as long as you choose an edge that actually like splits, the, splits it apart into two connected components. Um, and since we're dealing with level one networks, all we really care about are these things called sunlets, which are just like cycles. Uh, so this is a case of a four cycle with just little edges going off in each direction. So if we can understand these n sunlets for all n, then we figured out all level one networks. So that's the goal, figure it out for sunlets. There's only a single reticulation vertex. So maybe it's not so bad. So yeah, n sunlet network is just a cycle with a leaf glued to each vertex in the cycle. And there's a single reticulation vertex. 
uh, we're going to denote it SN. And there's two underlying trees. So that parameterization that we had before is a binomial because there's only two underlying trees. We had one term for each underlying tree. So uh, these, so if you multiply this monomial out all the way through, it's really just the sum of the parameterizations for the two underlying trees. Um, and you remember there were some weights, but um, those sort of got absorbed. Um, and it's not so hard to show that those don't really matter. Um, so uh, yeah, we have this parameterization. It's parameterized by binomials. It'd be nicer if they were monomials, but you know, sometimes life isn't perfect. Uh, so let's let's look at an example. Uh, let's look at the force on lift. This is a nice small example. Uh, you can ask Macaulay too, just to compute this thing, and you get a single quadrinomial. So it's it cuts that's a hypersurface that's cut out, and uh, well that's nice. You know it's like as nice as it could possibly be. And I've highlighted in red and uh, blue these two binomials. And the reason is is because if you delete e five and then you look at you look at the ideal generated by those two binomials, you get the you get the ideal for the tree. Um, that you get by deleting E5. And if I color them a different way, so now I look at this outside binomial and inside binomial, then those two binomials generate the other tree that you get by deleting E8. But there is something interesting that's happening. So if you intersect these two tree ideals, uh, that strictly contains the network ideal. Um, it, it has too many things. So for example, it has like a minimal generator in degree four, whereas the network ideal doesn't. And in fact, when you intersect these two uh, toric ideals, uh, you don't even get something that's prime. So it's like a problem. Um, so it's something to do with the intersection, but you know, um, we want to nail down what that actually is. Let's look at another example. So here's I of S5. And this is just sort of to see how complexity grows quickly. Um, I of S5 is generated by these 11 terms. And you have nine quadrinomials. Um, and then you have two binomials. Um, and so we want to understand, and again, it's generated in degree two. And if you recall, the tree ideals were also generated in degree two. And again, you can play this game where you say like, hey, if I look at um, these first, this first binomial and the second binomial, um, those end up lying in one of the tree ideals. And if you do it the other way, it lies the other tree ideal, so on and so forth. Something's happening. So what's happening? So first of all, we have this theorem that says if you have a sunlight ideal and the, you have these two trees, T1 and T2, uh, that you obtain by deleting reticulation edges, then the network ideal, a quadratic in the network ideal, it's in there if and only if it lies in the intersection of the two tree ideals. So the intersection is actually an equality if you only look at degree two, but it's probably not equality if you look at higher degrees. So for example, that was true in the n equals four case, and I didn't say it, but it's also true in the n equals five case. Um, and then the other thing that we have is that you can sort of look at the other way. So let's say you removed all the reticulation edges and you looked at that underlying tree. So now it has one fewer leaf. Well, then that ideal is strictly contained in the network ideal, which is strictly contained in the intersection of the two toric ideals of the two tree ideals, big tree ideals. And um, well, that's actually kind of nice because that gives us a, a bound on the dimension of, of this variety of this idea. So, it's known what the dimensions of tree ideals are. They're 2n minus 2, where n is the number of leaves, um, or 2n plus 2, I'm sorry, 2n plus 2. Um, and the strict inequality says that the dimension of this network ideal is one of three things, 2n minus 1, 2n, or 2n plus 1. Um, right. I don't remember what's on this next slide. Let's see. Ah, OK. So this is sort of nice, but it's not perfect because what we don't have is, I haven't really told you a full generating set yet. I've told you what all the quadratics are, but I haven't really said like 
what they are. Like I said, like, oh yeah, you just compute this intersection of ideals and then take all the degree two pieces. And if, uh, like that's a horrible answer, right? <laughs> like that's a lot of work in Macaulay two to do. So um, we would like to specify what those quadratics actually are. And then, um, you know, is that all of them? Does that give you a full generating set or knows? So let's see how you find the quadratic invariance. So um, it turns out that our network ideal is graded by Z to the N plus one. And you just give Q G one through G N this grading where you let the G I S live in Z instead of Z mod two now. And um, if you do this, then we have this like simplification. So if you fix a U, and you look at two U1 through UN, and you look at the youth graded piece of the network ideal, then it's non-trivial if and only if the following things happen. So um, all the UIs are either zero, one, or two, and the cardinality of the, it, of the places where the UI is one has to be even, and it has to be of size at least four. It's, if you sort of write down the parameterization and think about it for a while, this isn't so bad to show. And sort of even better than that is that um, if you have places where the UIs aren't one, so they're either zero or they're two, um, then those are sort of, those graded pieces are sort of lifts from some smaller network. Um, and you're looking in the, in the in the graded piece two, one, 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 and you take a basis for that and you can lift it to a basis for uh, the graded piece of the bigger network. So really, if you wanna understand these, these, these degree two things, you really just need to understand this, this piece, this two, one, 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 one. Okay, so that's great. So here's what they look like. I'm just gonna show you. Um, at first glance, it's kind of gross, but hopefully we can explain it a little bit. Actually, I take that back. It's not so bad. Um, so we're going to fix an even integer um, that's at least four. And uh, we're going to look at two subsets of uh, two to n minus one. So we look at the even numbers, which we're going to call math BBE, and the odd numbers, math BBO. And we're going to fix a vector in Z mod two to the two up through n minus one, so it's indexed by you know the numbers two through n minus one, and we're going to require that if you restrict to the even indices, it's not zero, and if you restrict to the odd indices, it's not identically zero. And then we define this polynomial. And okay, so you got to know what this g zero zero g c e zero is, all that stuff. Well, what it is is if you look at g c prime comma c double prime. Basically, it's the unique group element in Z mod two to the N whose partial sums are recorded by the vectors uh, C prime and C double prime. So C prime is telling you what all the, um, what all the, if you, if you take the even partial sums, it's telling you what those are. And C double prime is telling you about all the odd, odd partial sums. And there's a unique G that um, uh, satisfies these things as long as you assume that the first thing is zero. And then uh, H C prime C double prime is just gonna be sort of the complement in Z mod two to the N of that vector. And then now the, this polynomial sort of makes sense. So this gives us a formula for finding them. And um, if you take all of these FCs, so you, you go over all C so that the restrictions to the even set and odd set are identically zero, um, then you get a basis for this graded piece of the network ID of this two, one, 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 one thing. And by the previous slide, this gives you sort of everything. So um, that's kind of, uh, that's sort of the story for quadratics is we can describe them explicitly. Um, and another thing that's sort of interesting is uh, the pattern that we were seeing earlier about if you split it into two binomials. So for example, um, if I look at this first one, notice that the odd, the second indices aren't changing. So this is corresponding to, this, is, this tells you that you're gonna have a binomial uh, for the tree where you delete one of them, one of the edges. And same thing over here. So you see that all the, uh, 
all of the, the, C, the second components fixed. And so it's, that's, that's also an invariant for the same underlying tree as the other one. And then if you do the outside ones and the inside one, then uh, that gives it to you for the other tree. So that pattern that we were seeing earlier, you know, holds sort of in general. And so that was sort of our main thing. As we said, like, hey, we figured out all the quadratics. We have a nice little algorithm for computing them. And um, then we were like, hey, you know what would be great is if we could show that that's it. Those are all the generators. And um, we couldn't figure it out. So. Uh, if you have an idea to figure it out, that would be awesome. I would love to hear it because I am convinced. So here's the deal is first of all, we had that question about the dimension. It was one of three numbers. It was two n minus one, two n or two n plus one. So like in Macaulay too, you can check dimension pretty easily using like uh, Jacobians and stuff. And so we were to look up to like n equals 30. And we're just like, yeah, the dimension is two n for all of those. And we're like, okay, so it's like gotta be true. It has to be true. You know, it's gotta be. What else could it be? And also we were able to check uh, that if you go up to an eight sunlit idea, uh, sunlit, uh, an eight sunlit, that that's also generated by the quadratics that we've described. So we've got the full thing there. Um, but we, we were unable to prove either of these two things. Uh, but we think it's of dimension two n and it's generated by quadratics. So that's our conjecture and um, you know, future work. So there's sort of like immediate things that we'd like to finish. Um, you know, future problems that we might be interested in are uh, just like for trees, there was an efficient algorithm for tree reconstruction. We'd like to find that for networks too. So something in terms of splits and, you know, if you have this data, you'd like to be able to build a level one network that fits the data. Um, also, you know, this is, this, was, this is like sort of my dream for this project is um, there's this really cool paper by uh, Buczynski and Vishnevsky about these uh, phylogenetic tree ideals. And it's called like, you know, phylogenetic algebraic geometry from like a geometer's point of view or something. And it's great because it's just like, hey, these are, they're just, they're interested in them because they're just like, they're just cool torque varieties. We get cool polytopes, you know, we can talk about their, you know, Earhart series and all that stuff. And it's just a cool paper, you know? And I really wanted to do that for sunlets or something. Uh, but, you know, so maybe one day that, that would be awesome to think about. Um, and then another thing is, you know, looking at the tropical geometry of these ideals. I mean, the reason this might be useful is actually, if you had a good understanding of the tropical variety for these things, um, that would probably give you enough information to prove our conjecture, because it would tell you enough about the initial ideals and it would obviously tell you dimension. So uh, anyway, those are things that I think would be interesting in the future. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate um, you guys giving me the time to talk. All right, let's thank, thank Joe. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, shoot. Uh, so the first is that you these are you said these are level one networks. Yeah. So just from the sketches I have on my paper, that basically means if you have a horizontal gene transfer, you then don't horizontally transfer again to something like outside. Is that yeah. essentially That's what true. that means? Yeah, that is true. Okay. Like, yeah, you could have like, you could you like horizontally gene transfer and then you could have like descendants that horizontally gene transfer. Right. But you couldn't like horizontally gene transfer with something that was like from, you know, some other branch of the tree or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what my sketches seem to indicate. Uh, I guess I had one other kind of very initial question from way back at the beginning before we introduced um, I didn't write down what it was, uh, the CFN model. So mm -hmm. when, when we're trying to work in full generality or whatever, mm -hmm. it seems to me like these hidden Markov matrices, if you give them full generality, um, you can completely ignore, like they don't, they can forget every, everything from the previous step. Like if they just have the columns are constant 
or maybe yeah. some stress or constant. You're just like, I have no information from the previous step and I just set my distribution now. Yeah. It's like with that, like, yes, any probability distribution is possible by forgetting the all tree data. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, so I do know, so maybe this isn't directly answering your question, but you know, we talked about the CFN model and that, yeah. that was making some assumptions about how evolution happens or something. Right, exactly. And but there's, there's lots of other models that are also group-based. So you notice I kept putting Z mod two instead of just like zero and one. Well, there's other group-based models that are also very well understood. Okay. Um, that are, um, you know, they're a little bit more complicated, but in, in fact, in the same Sturmfeld Sullivan paper, they talk about like a Z mod four model and a Z mod two cross Z mod two model. And, you know, you can talk about it for like any really abelian group. You can do a, a similar sort of thing. And all you're basically saying is that like, once you fix your group, you're saying that your transition matrices have to take a certain form. Sure. So um, I don't know if that totally answers your question, but it does sort of like, there are other restrictions that we can make on transition matrices right. that are still interesting and maybe give us something that's uh, like a little bit more like, uh, uh, losing the word, but. Um, I mean, you answered my question. I didn't have a question. It's more of a comment on that. Like you really do need the structure on the transition matrices or else. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's hopeless, but it's good to know that there are several different structures you can put on these matrices. Um, yeah, for sure. I should have put I mean, that on there, but you know, there's other uh, you know models that. So, like one thing that would be like probably not so hard to do is like you could probably do a lot of what we did um, for like the K2P model, which is like a Z mod four model, um, and it would be more complicated and probably more work, but like um, it would be doable if that makes sense. And you could do the same sorts of models and like the, the splitting along an edge to just still work out fine and all that stuff. One thing I would be curious about, and I don't wanna hog up all the question time, so I'll leave it here, is that it, are there, you know, can, is an example of a probability distribution where one model says this tree is impossible and the other model says, oh yeah, this tree is doable. Oh. Um, I guess that, I mean, I guess that could happen. Um, that would be interesting. I don't know. That that actually does sound pretty cool to know if that could happen. Because I, that, that might even hypothetically be a testable hypothesis of going like of the fossil record. I mean, unlikely, but. Yeah, for sure. That would be, I mean, that would be kind of crazy, actually. That'd be weird. But yeah, I, that would be cool. I would be, I would love to see an example like that. Okay, I'm out of questions. Okay, thanks for your questions. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, if not, uh, then we'll thank Joe again. Thank you, Joe, for the very interesting, good talk.